literary works of Allah Hazrat literary works of Allah Hazrat الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الصلاة والسلام عليك يا رسول الله وعلى آلك وأصحابك يا حبيب الله الصلاة والسلام عليك يا نبي الله وعلى آلك وأصحابك يا نور الله Dear viewers, welcome to another episode of our program The Literary Works of Ala Hazrat Inshallah, we'll be discussing more beautiful works of the great Imam. But before we do so, let us mention an excellence of reciting Salat upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa alihi Wasallam has mentioned that whenever Salat is recited upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a gathering, in a majlis, what happens, a beautiful fragrance emanates from that gathering until it reaches the heights of the sky and the blessed angels who are there they state that this is coming from a majlis in which salat was recited upon the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam subhanallah dear viewers think about it where on the earth we could be in our homes in a gathering we could be in the masjid or wherever we are and we recite in that gathering salat upon the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam what happens a fragrance emanates reaches the heights of the skies of what happens thereafter the angels the innocent angels of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they are able to smell that fragrance and they say this is coming from such a majlis in which salat was recited upon the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so humble request make every gathering of yours fragrant like this and we have that opportunity as long as we're alive, as long as we're breathing and we are able to use our tongue, we can make our majalis, our gatherings fragrant. Inshallah, you will see the benefits of that in this world are more important in the hereafter as well. Sallu ala al-habib sallallahu ta'ala ala Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So continuing the texts, the works of Allah Hazrat Rahmatullahi alayhi and remember, in these few episodes, we cannot do justice to the works of Allah Hazrat. We are just highlighting, we are just touching upon the works of this great Imam. Otherwise, scholars have written PhDs on the works of Allah Hazrat. Scholars have devoted their lives to the works of Allah Hazrat Rahmatullahi Alayhi. So, of course, we cannot do any sort of justice in a few episodes. But the reason we're mentioning the works of Allah Hazrat to you is so that you gain motivation. You gain encouragement, inshallah, to study the works. And inshallah, after hearing about these works, the recognition of Allah Hazrat, the understanding of who this man was in your mind will inshallah increase. And you'll begin to respect this great Imam, realizing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him as a gift for the Ummah. Subhanallah. We are forever indebted to the great Imam, Allah Hazrat Imam Ahmad Raza Khan Ali Rahmatu Rahman. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows our coming generations to benefit from him as well. Now, as it was the, the role, the job of Allah Hazrat Rahmatullahi Ali as a mujaddid to remove bid'at innovations, to eradicate them. He wrote a beautiful book, Az Zubdatu Zakiya Fi Tahrimi Sajdat al Tahiyya. The pure cream on the prohibition of prostration in homage. Basically, a particular person was asked about a particular sheikh and he allows people to prostrate to him out of reverence, out of respect. Sajdatu tahiyya means the sajda, the prostration of respect or reverence. And what that shaykh gives in proof for this amal, for this action, allowing this action to take place in his presence and allowing people to prostrate to him, what he gave as evidence was that Sayyiduna Adam was also prostrated towards, and it's mentioned in the Quran, 
meaning the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they prostrated to Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam. And this was a prostration of reverence, of respect, not of worship. And hence it's allowed as well for people today and for shuyukh to be prostrated towards. Ma'adhullah, thubma ma'adhullah. Now, Allah Hazrat unequivocally, he refutes this claim. And again, proving from various hadith that this is a haram act, meaning it's forbidden, it's prohibited for an ummah to prostrate to another individual out of respect. This is haram, and if he were to do so with the intention of worshipping that person, meaning he believes that person is worthy of worship and therefore he prostrates to him, then he leaves the fold of Islam. He is no longer a Muslim. And I would like to read to you the first few lines of the answer of Allah Azat Ali Rahmah. SubhanAllah. And this gives us the gist of the book, what is contained in the book. Allah Azat Rahmatullahi Ali says, O Muslim, O obedient follower of the Sharia of Mustafa, know and know it with certitude that one is not permitted to prostrate to anyone except the Lord Almighty Allah. Glorified is He. If one prostrates to anyone else in worship, meaning with the intention of worship, it is base idolatry, meaning it is shirk and patent disbelief. Prostration out of reverence or greeting is strictly forbidden, haram and an enormity. Indeed, prostrating to an idol or a cross, the sun or the moon will be ruled kafir. Absolutely. So Allah has mentioned here the rulings for every one of us. Now, some people object, some people might say, the sons of Sayyiduna Yaqub prostrated to him, this is mentioned in Surah Yusuf. Now, the answer to that, the simple answer is, that was a different Sharia. Ahkam have changed, and that was a different Ummah. And this is the final Prophet, Sayyiduna Muhammad وسلم, and the Ahkam for us are different. We cannot prostrate to someone out of respect, out of reverence. This is not allowed. And I just like to clarify something as well. That if we see someone prostrating to another individual or prostrating towards, for example, the maqam of a saint, the tomb of a saint or something similar, then we cannot jump to conclusions and we cannot apply the fatwa of kufr, disbelief from ourselves straight away. Why? The scholars explain beautifully. They say that Islam in our religion, we are taught that to the utmost of our ability, we save someone's iman. We don't be hasty in putting the fatwa of kufr on somebody. Now, if somebody is prostrating towards someone, it may be the case that he is doing a lesser of the two crimes. What does that mean? Meaning he is prostrating to him out of respect which is still haram, which is still forbidden, but it does not nullify someone's iman. So it is upon the intention of the one doing this wrong act, whether he is in intending to honor that person or is intending to worship that person. And only he knows. We do not have any such tool or equipment from which we can gauge this. We can understand what his intention is. This is between him and Allah. But what we must do as ummatis of the Prophet ﷺ is to give the call of righteousness. Amrun bil ma'roof wa yinahyun anil munkar. And we must forbid evil. If we see something like this, we must kindly, lovingly, affectionately teach that person that, oh brother, this is wrong. That in Islam, it's forbidden to prostrate to someone out of respect. And like this, inshallah, if we use an affectionate, compassionate approach, that person will be grateful to us that we have taught him a beautiful ruling of our deen. And alhamdulillah, this book of Allah, rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi, this is also, this silences those people who claim that followers of the great Imam, that people who attribute themselves to the great Imam of Bareilly, they are grave worshippers. Ma'adullah. And this is a wrong claim that's made by certain people. Alhamdulillah, Allah, rahmatullahi alayhi, wrote a whole booklet on this topic. This is the answer to that objection. That the great Imam never ever in his lifetime endorsed or promoted prostrating to another person out of respect. 
He said it's haram, it's forbidden. And yet you have people today who claim that followers of the great Imam do so. And they believe it's jais to do so, or it's permissible to do so. This couldn't be further from the truth. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant guidance to such people. And if we study the works of Allah, we will come to realize that all of these are lies. These claims have no basis. And knowledge is what empowers a person. When you have knowledge of this epistle, this booklet, you will realize that no way, shape or form, can a follower of Allah, a true follower, who knows about his works, who studies his works, and he knows what fatawa he issued, he will never do such a thing, inshallah. So this was a beautiful work of Allah rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi. Another work of Allah rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi is titled Barakatul Imdad Li Ahlil Istimdad The Blessing of Aid for Those Who Seek Aid As you can tell from the title Alhamdulillah this is an epistle, a work of Allah where he clarifies that those who seek help from the saints of Allah, from the prophets alayhimu salatu wassalam as well, from the awliyaullah, they are not committing shirk at all. They are not committing polytheism at all. Let me tell you the background. People claimed that the verse of the Quran, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ and specifically the second part of this verse, that we seek help only from thee, from you, uh, they use this to prove that asking help from anyone else is tantamount to disbelief, to polytheism, to shirk. And Allah Azza Rahmatullahi Alayhi clarifies, He answers this particular objection using various Quranic ayahs, so many ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to prove that no, if you seek help from the awliya Allah, if you seek help from the Prophet Sallallahu Wasallam, you remain a believer. Why? Because a believer, when he does so, he believes that the Prophets السلام, the righteous people, the awliyaullah, that they are intercessors, they are intermediaries, they are means to the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They do not for a single moment consider a Prophet, a Nabi or a Rasul or a Wali or a Salih, a righteous person to be Allah Azza wa Jal. No, this would be shaykh. But no true believer believes that. True believers it is their belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given power, has granted and bestowed power to these salihin, the awliya, the prophets alayhi salam, to help the ummah. It's all from the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the permission of Allah and the power gifted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the haqiqi helper, the real helper is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala independently helps. Meaning nobody gives Allah the ability to help. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the haqiqi helper and we seek help from him. But when we seek help from his creation, it is based on this belief and this thinking. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed them with that power to do so. And this is why it's perfectly fine and permissible to do so. And again, Allah has it through this risala, Barakatul Imdad li Ahlil Istimdad, has said, if you do so, you will gain blessings. And he proves it through ahadith, through accounts of the people of the past, that they called out for help, for example, from the Anbiya, from, from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa from the Awliyaullah, and they attained help as well. And ultimately, this help is the help of Allah Jalla wa'ala. Because not for a single moment does that Ummati believe that this help is from the Wali, the Nabi Rasul themselves, that they did not gain this help or this power to help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is something very important, even in this day and age, the awam should also learn a lesson, they're quick to point fingers at others. They may have heard a deviant person say that it's wrong to ask help from other than Allah and not explain verses in the correct context and misguide others and before you know it, Awamun Nas, people in the public are issuing fatwa. They are putting fatwa of kufr and heresy on others. So this shouldn't be the case. Knowledge, knowledge, knowledge is very, very important. And the person who has knowledge will have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He will think 10 times, many more times than that actually, before he even says such a thing about a fellow Muslim. In his mind, in his heart, he will always have husnud dhan about a fellow Muslim. He will not claim that he is a polytheist. He won't claim that he's a non-Muslim. And he'll be fearful about his own self. How can I issue 
a verdict of disbelief on someone else. And there's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that when one issues a verdict of disbelief on someone else and that verdict does not apply to them, then it returns to the person who issued it. This is the mafhum of a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it's very, very careful that we don't fall prey to this. We sit with scholars, and I've stressed this throughout the program, sit with Sunni scholars, sit with authentic muftiyan kiram and learn deen from them. Remember, this is a deen that has passed on from chest to chest. Alhamdulillah, the Prophet Ali wasalam, he taught the Sahaba, the Sahaba taught the Tabi'een, the Tabi'een taught the Atba'u Tabi'een, and like this, the generations learn from one another. Alhamdulillah, this chain is continuing. We have to sit with scholars. If you say to someone, uh, I advise you to have your operation done by so-and-so, you will say, show me his credentials, what are his qualifications, is he even a professional? How can I lay on the table and allow him to operate on me if I don't know if he is legit or not, if he is authentic, he might end up harming me. And similarly, if you want to carry out work in your home, an extension or something else, you will ask 10 people, you will ask about so many quotes, you will look at the portfolio of that person's work, where has he carried out work before, what level of work does he do. You will make sure that you don't suffer any dunyavi, worldly harm, nuqsan. But why is it when it comes to the deen, we listen to anyone and everyone? That we hear a clip, five minute clip, somebody sent to us, and we close our eyes on that person and we say, he's a very charismatic speaker, and whatever he says, I believe it. How, how can that be the case? You don't even know where he studied, you don't know what his beliefs are regarding Allah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa etc. What happens is he might say a thing that stays embedded in your heart. He may enter a wrong belief in your heart, and because you don't have closeness to ulama, you don't sit with the ulama, you're never going to ask about that thing. That will become rasikh in your heart, that will become your aqidah. And Allah forbid in the hereafter, a person can face regret and remorse as well. So it's very, very important that we always sit with the ulama. Another beautiful work of the great Imam, subhanAllah, his love for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was unparalleled, was matchless. And he was someone who firmly believed that Rasulullah wasallam's blessings extended to one and all, whether one realizes it or not. And as part of this, he believed that Rasulullah wasallam's forefathers, his parents, his grandparents, and his lineage all the way back to Sayyidina Adam salam, he believed, just like many, many scholars of the past, that the parents of Rasulullah sallallahu and his lineage all the way back, all of them were mu'mineen, all of them were muwahideen, they testified to the oneness of Allah, the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not a single one of the forefathers of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was a mushrik ma'adhullah. And Allah Hazrat Rahmatullahi Alayhi wrote many rasail on this, just one I would like to mention to you, Shumulul Islam li usulil rasulil kiram. The honorable forebears of the messenger are included among Muslims. Now again, in Allah's time, and to this day, sadly, some people are very open in saying that the Prophet Wasallam's parents were not believers. And they treat it as something that they have to tell everybody. Now, if this is not disease in the heart, then what is? That you're trying to force people to believe in this. Now, Allah Ta'ala Alayhi, he mentions in this that the majority of Sunni scholars, in their love and respect to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, they incline towards the position that the parents of the Prophet ﷺ were Muslims and as such they will gain salvation, inshaAllah. And Imam Jalaluddin Suyuti rahmatullahi alayhi, he wrote a number of epistles as well. Allah rahmatullahi alayhi quotes Imam Jalaluddin Suyuti Shafi'i rahmatullahi alayhi, the mujaddid of his time. And he mentions that he also wrote many epistles, many booklets in this regard. The blessed parents of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa were believers, were mu'mineen. And in this booklet, Allah Azad rahmatullahi alayhi, he lists hadith, verses of the Quran, proving the salvation of the parents. And he names 35 major hadith and fiqh imams who have explicitly attested to this belief. I'd just like to mention a few points of the great imam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, وَلَا عَبْدٌ مُؤْمِنٌ خَيْرٌ مِّن مُشْرِكٍ A believing slave is better than a mushrik, a polytheist. And وَلَا عَمَةٌ مُؤْمِنَةٌ خَيْرٌ مِّن مُشْرِكَةٍ 
and a believing slave girl is better than a polytheist woman. Now, Allah Taala He presents a hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that I was always placed in the best of lineages. This is a lengthy hadith where Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala divided the people and He always put me in the best of them until eventually He chose me from Quraysh. And it's a lengthy hadith as well. And Allah says. If Rasulullah is saying, is telling us that he was always kept amongst the best of people, and the Quran is also saying that the believers are the best, then how can the parents of Rasulullah be non Muslims? How can they be from the Mushrikeen? Ma'adallah Azza wa Jal. And that was just one evidence he gives. He gives so many different evidences. He quotes Tafasir, for example, Imam Razi Rahmatullahi Ali mentions. وَتَقَلُّبَكَ فِي السَّاجِدِينَ This ayah refers to the Prophet ﷺ transferring from the loins of his predecessors. And فِي السَّاجِدِينَ We see you being transferred amongst the Sajideen, those who prostrate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and worship him. And Imam Razi is saying that this refers to the Prophet ﷺ going from pure loins to pure wombs. He was always transferred from pure loins to pure wombs. So how can a person think for a second that his parents were not from the believers when they were always from amongst the Sajideen, all of his forefathers. So like this Allah Hazrat Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Alhamdulillah, he clarifies the position of the majority of Ahlul Sunnah and he says the parents of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are believers. And Qibla Amir Ahlul Sunnah Dawud Barakatum Aliyah, he beautifully quotes an example as well in one of his books. And he says, think for a moment, Sayyiduna Yunus alayhi salam, the great prophet of Allah, he was in the, the stomach of the whale. And the Quran mentions this. And because he stayed in the stomach of that whale, the blessing for the whale is that it will enter paradise. The people of the cave, Ashabul Kahf, there was a dog Qitumir who was guarding them because of the blessings of being close to the awliyaullah, the ashabul kaf, the dog will go to Jannah in the form of man. So if these things, whales, if a dog will go to Jannah because of their association with the pious, then what do you say about the blessed parents of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Sayyidatuna Amina radiyallahu ta'ala anha in whose pure womb the Prophet ﷺ stayed for many, many months. Will she not enter paradise? Of course she will enter paradise. And Rasulullah ﷺ will admit his parents into paradise as well. This is our belief. Alhamdulillah. In this work, Allah proves that. And this was another beautiful, remarkable work of his, a tajdidi work of his as well. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, we have this beautiful aqidah today because of him. We covered some of the texts that the great Imam wrote. And as I mentioned earlier, we cannot do justice. People's lives have been spent in trying to understand the intelligence, the, the blessings of this great Imam, the, the rank and maqam of Imam Ahmad Raza Khan. Rahmatullahi ta'ala. So it goes without saying that these episodes are just an insight. We're just highlighting the importance of the great Imam and how he should hold a focal point and place in our life insha'Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us true love for the great Mujadid of Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to instill the love of Imam Ahmad Raza Khan Ali Rahma in our children's hearts as well. The scholars of Islam have said that if you hold on to Allah Hazrat Rahmatullahi Ali, insha'Allah with the mercy of Allah Jalla wa ala, you will never be misguided. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept what has been said and enable us to learn from it as well. Amin bijahin nabi al amin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam literary works of ala hazrat literary works of ala hazrat